have Yoli, we have Mary, we have Jenny, uh, we have Barrett, and we have me. Um, does someone want, ever want to do their own little thing first, or they just go? Uh, okay. Yoli, what am I proposing? Uh, hi, I'm Yoli. Um, I'm the LGBT UA plus officer at Warwick SU. LGBT UA plus stands for lesbian, gay, bi, trans, undefined and asexual plus. Um, and so I'm going to talk a bit about um, asexuality at Warwick. Um, and I also was involved in uh, getting asexuality included in the NUS LGBT campaign. Um, so I'm going to talk a bit about that as well. <laughs> So a little bit about the uh, history of asexuality at Warwick. Um, I was really lucky when I arrived at Warwick because uh, Warwick already included asexuality um, in our LGBT plus society. Um, I believe since 2006 um, it's been part of our acronym um, and it's really exciting. I think we're still the only place that has it as part of the acronym specifically, uh, but I know lots and lots of LGBT societies now uh, include asexuality under queer or plus or star or whatever they put at the end. Um, so that was really exciting being in a community which already included asexuality uh, there. Uh, and in uh, February 2011, which is further away than I thought it was, um, I ran to be the asexual representative on our executive committee. Um, there has been an asexual representative position on the exec uh, since asexuality was included. Um, but for at least a couple of years before me, uh, there hadn't been an asexual rep, um, so I kind of started it again. <laughs> um, so as asexual rep, I organised some events for the uh, Asexual Awareness Week 2011. Um, we tried and failed to have a screening of a asexual film, which we did show eventually. Um, as well as uh, a workshop on asexual activism, which I ran, um, and also uh, we went to a research thing, which I think Mark probably will talk about in a little bit, I don't know. Um, and so, yeah, as part of, and as well as during Asexual Awareness Week, um, I also went to and did workshops at other places. Me and Michael went to Birmingham and did a workshop there, and I did some workshops at work as well. Uh, so that was really exciting, and now I have a successor, um, who, so that's awesome, I'm no longer the asexual rep, um, I'm the campaigns officer now, um, but I have a successor, so the asexual rep positions <laughs> no longer going to be unfilled forever. Um, so about NUS, um, just a little bit of history about asexuality within NUS LGBT. Um, NUS is the National Union of Students, um, and they have a separate um, liberation campaign, um, they, they have autonomous uh, groups, so um, LGBT people organise their own membership and uh, have got their own policy and stuff. Um, and for a few years now, uh, people have been, have proposed asexuality to be included, um, and it's never happened. <laughs> um, and just sort of an idea of where this stands, like asexuality hasn't been uh, included. Um, in the last few years. Um, queer became an official part of the membership a few years ago, um, and I, it, five years ago it's been gestured to me, um, and more than five, but I think less than ten years ago, it was still the NUS LGB campaign. So the fact that now we have asexuality is pretty amazing. Um, so myself and uh, some other asexual students that I knew, um, Ollie is making faces at me, um, and also um, a recently finished member of the NUS LGBT committee um, put forward a motion, uh, sort of organised online, wrote a motion together um, to include asexuality within the campaign. And we took this to the NUS LGBT conference earlier this year. Um, I turned up with a box of 250 leaflets um, <laughs> and pretty much just sort of badgered everyone I met to to support the motion, I spent hours talking about asexuality um, on a Friday when I'd woken up at 5 a.m. Um, <laughs> but um, finally, um, we were discussing, discussing the motion 
uh, during conference. Um, I, don't, I, can't, some, I can't remember whether anyone spoke against probably they did, they did. Um, but several asexual students spoke for the motion. Um, it was generally well received whenever we were speaking to anyone at the conference, it was well received. Um, and the motion passed which is amazing, uh, with over a two-thirds majority as well, which is pretty fantastic. <laughs> yeah, so basically, um, that means that asexuals are part of the membership of the campaign. Um, so we define who can attend any of the key events, um, and this now includes asexuals, um, as well as people with minority, romantic and sexual orientations and other exciting things. Um, also, we've mandated the NUSLGT committee to run a workshop about asexuality at their activist training later this year, um, and for there to be uh, asexual caucuses, so asexual people can meet and sort of discuss their policies at NUSLGT events. So it's sort of a big push for asexuals to start organising within NUS. Um, yeah, so that's really exciting. Hey, hello, um, I am Mary. Some of you may some of you may know me as Cleander on Haven or as Next Step Cake on Tumblr. Um, so I do a lot of activism work as a member of the project team on Haven. Uh, specifically, I do a lot of work with social media. So if you've ever, ever been spammed with PT stuff on Tumblr or on Facebook or on anywhere, like on Avon or anywhere else, that was probably me. Um, apologize for all the updates. But, um, so there's been a lot of, one of the things that I've been working on a lot is collecting resources into one place. Because people have made all sorts of wonderful resources, posters, guides, art, all sorts of things. So one of the projects has been collecting that. If you look at Avon, there's a giant list of links that you can look at. Um, also been a lot of work just trying to get outreach and connections between, like say, Avon and the Tumblr community, or Avon and some of the Facebook communities. Um, in addition to that, I've also done a lot of offline activism as a student at UC Berkeley. Um, I'm a member of the Queer Strain Alliance at Berkeley, and I also interned for a semester at the LGBT uh, Gender Equity Center. So I have done a lot of work with LGBT organizations there, um, and we had got a bunch of people to come over for Asexual Awareness Week. We had a screening, we had a panel, we had a flyering campaign. Um, when I first got to the university, uh, it was actually really lucky in that the environment was already fairly asexual friendly, but there weren't really many out asexual people there. So a lot of them were like, cool, we, we, we support asexuality, uh, we just don't know anything about it. So. It was a start, and I was also lucky enough to find a lot of other asexuals there. Um, in addition to, there's also a good, large asexual community in San Francisco and the surrounding area. And so with that support, we found, in the last couple of years, we've gotten together a lot. We're in the process of starting an asexual student group there, and we've done a lot of outreach. We've had asexual speakers at multiple queer and LGBT conferences on the campus, and we've been doing a lot of activism with that. Um, so I guess that's a brief introduction. So um, I've done a few different things. People might recognize my face from a variety of stuff. I started doing um, disability with the Hot Piece of Ace charm. Um, I was one of the original members of it. It was started by somebody who unfortunately could only ever do the one um, and then had to leave the channel for personal reasons. So it kind of it was a bit messy at the start, but then it kind of got going. I did it for about a year. Various members left and we re-auditioned. I think at the moment it seems to have sort of faded quite like we've gone through a lot of members in the past while, but there's other channels out there that were kind of spawned from it. I think the Dapper Aces kind of came on as people who didn't get through our auditions but decided to form their own channel, which was great, and that was kind of our intention in the beginning was that we would have like 12 people but we kind of wanted anybody who didn't get on our channel to maybe go out and do their own, rather than it feeling like, oh, these are the official people, because we never really claimed that, we just accidentally ended up doing it. Um, and then from that, I've done a few things. Um, I ended up on the BBC in a program called How Sex Works um, with my great friend, um, because they were originally going to have a few of us, but the time constraints, they decided that apparently, because I was in a couple 
that meant that they could do all the whole emotional story and it looked really good for BBC. Um, so there was kind of a day's worth of filming um, with very little notice on that. And then from that they did an article on the BBC, um, which was well, sometime, it was in the top three most read articles that day for pretty much the whole day. Um, and it got paid, like, posted around a lot of the internet and I got a lot of various questions because I'm pretty easy to find. I have a very distinct last name and I have quite a distinct hairstyle. Uh, so I got a lot of like, people finding me on Facebook. And from that, I got a load of media requests. I got This Morning, The Sun, um, I did The Guardian, which I passed to the PT team because I did my finals instead. <laughs> um, so that's kind of, so I vanished after that. But then I think. So most of the side I've been involved in is kind of media side, but on a smaller level in Oxford, which is where I'm from, the LGBT group is, it's not limiting, but the T is very recent, it's, it's much more recent than Warwick's T, um, and they're still a little funny about the Q, as in we don't have one, and they don't seem to want one. Um, but outside of the official university, there's a lot more groups that, I mean, there's a group I'm a member of, which are, sounds unusual, they're a queer feminist burlesque group, um, I don't perform with them, I write for them, and they have two asexual members, myself and another girl. Um, and they are currently doing a show which will be going to Edinburgh and touring called Alternative Sex Education. And one of the things they've now got in as well is they're including sort of general queer education, they've included kinky things, but as well as focusing on the sex side of sex education, they've actually got um, a wonderful song to the tune Bad Touch by the Bloodhound Gang, if any of you know it. Is currently in the works as an asexual version that will be hopefully going on tour with them. So we've got some performance going out there, and generally that's what I do, and I'll be doing more. No, I'm not even here anymore. So. Hello, my name's Mark McClellan, alias the SMG on Avon. Uh, just a very brief history is um, when I first discovered the existence of other asexuals in 14th of October 2004, which for me was an epiphany, it was fantastic. I then um, joined uh, Avon in, in, um, in November of uh, 2004, which was fantastic, being able to actually talk and interact with other people like myself. I first met other asexual people at, um, or knowingly met other asexual people at a I was at a meeting in January of 2005, and I've been to lots and lots of meetings since then. And, and fairly shortly after I joined, I then got involved with the, uh, the advisory team, where people would send requests in to um, Avon asking about themselves, or curious about asexuality, or thought they might be asexual. And then, a bit further on from that, I then became involved with the uh, media team, because I remember the first time I discovered the actual existence of other asexual being an epiphany, I thought, well, you know, I'd like to put something back into that, and if I, if I can actually sort of um, <coughs> reach someone else in, in, in the same way, then I, I, you know, that, that, I, you know I, I find that extremely satisfying. And that since then, I've been, um, been, I don't tend to do activism types, of, apart from going on sort of pride marches, but I do uh, sort of media side, so I've been, um, I've been on the radio about six or seven times um, for a sometimes sort of live programme. So I've also been on the television three times. I mean, Doctor Doctor, Doctor on, on Channel Five, uh, Trisha on Channel Five, and one of the uh, one of my most satisfying radio appearances was on um, Saturday Live on Radio Four when Feed Love used to present that. I got some really nice feedback from that from older people that more like to be listening to that kind of radio show as opposed to the more sort of youth orientated programmes. And it was describing essentially the same kind of thing as when I discovered it, because I was I was about I was forty essentially when I discovered the existence of other asexual people. And so lots of younger people have the advantage of of the internet and, and sort of social networking and all this kind of thing. But it was for me, so that's not later in my in my life. And some of the feedback I got from, from the, particularly the, uh, the Saturday Live programme, was from people of my sort of demographic or perhaps older, that, you know, it, it, cha it essentially changed their lives, you know, that they thought, wow, you know, I've been sort of thinking there's something wrong with me or just had no interest and not known, not sort of known anything about it. And then suddenly it, it's essentially enlightened them. So, so that's essentially what I do, is, is I do the visibility, the visibility stuff.
on the uh, asexual advice Tumblr, and uh, so that's kind of my, I just, other than the flag, that's one. <laughs> uh, we've got question and answers now, so uh, if anyone wants to ask anything. Okay, so um, we've heard from five people who've um, been involved in some very cool visibility, visibility and education work. Um, I'm sure lots of people have some questions. Uh, hi. Actually, can you hear me without that? Yeah. 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 Okay, thank you. Um, well, first of all, thank, I must thank everybody involved for getting this together, because I, until, until last Thursday when it was mentioned in Metro newspaper, I had no idea it existed, it was fantastic. Um, I'm not sure whether now is the right time to, to, to raise these issues, but looking at the programme, I couldn't find any better one. Firstly, it's a question of, in, for me, a question of inclusivity. I don't know whether to include myself as an asexual or not. And what I've heard so far hasn't really helped me all that much. And the reason for that is that um, looking at the leaflets and, 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 and what I've heard, uh, we've got expressions like having sex, sexual attraction, um, and... Um, exp expressing romantic love in a sexual way. And I get confused about that because I'm wondering what do we actually mean by those terms? Uh, for instance, in my case, I've, I've never been interested in penetrating another person, whether I like it or not. But that hasn't stopped me from having romantic relations or even physical relationships, which have resulted in some excitation of the genitals of one or other or both. Um, and I just feel that if, if, I, if I can be part of this, I, I personally would need a much clearer picture of what we mean by asexuality as opposed to non-gender identification or gender independent or neutral or something like that. Um, and I think that, yeah, that's, that's all I'd like to ask at this stage. Thanks. Okay, um, who would like to take that? I get asked this a lot. <laughs> so my boyfriend um, isn't asexual. So this is kind of why this comes up for me a lot because I am. Um, and I tend to, I think the clearest expression that I've heard, and it's not very clear when you experience it, but is just the phrase like not experiencing sexual attraction. And obviously, kind of the phrase sexual attraction to people who don't experience it is kind of a little confusing and the easiest way I found it is that everybody I've asked who isn't asexual can not explain it but there is a distinct difference in my experience to their experience and it may come out in kind of vague like oh well I feel like well you know when you look at a guy and you kind of, but vague as it is it's something I definitely can't connect to and that means I do have romantic attraction however I mean you can not have to, that's being aromantic, but as a heteroromantic, they're definitely the state of things. So that means sort of when I'm around my boyfriend, I am romantically attracted to him, and I would say that's still consistent with being asexual because it's definitely distinct from a sexual experience. That doesn't mean that because he is an asexual that I'm never ever going to be in a situation that could be considered sexual. But it's the sort of, it sounds a bit odd to be going to subject to things because it's so hard to explain. But the fact is, in those situations, I feel very differently, and I know I do, because we've discussed it, to what he does. So my desire in that case may be to be close to my boyfriend. It may be because, well, kind of, I work, it's enjoyable, but I don't necessarily have kind of the interest there. And a friend of mine who, again, not asexual, I was talking to yesterday, and I was trying to explain it to her because... I only told you, sir. Um, and she came up with the idea, and I thought this was a really nice one, that she kind of, she doesn't do alcohol, basically. She kind of, it's the thing, it's around. All her friends are like, yeah, I really want to get drunk. I'm going to go out, I'm going to do this, I'm going to get drunk. And she's like, cool, you go and do that. Um, I'll go over here and have coffee. Um, but sometimes she'll go out with her friends who she's really close to, she really trusts, and she has like a special thing with them, and they might get drunk. Um, she didn't have a desire to get drunk before doing that. 
her desire was, I'm going to go and have fun with these guys. And what happened was well, she got broke. And then the day after, she's like, yeah, okay, yeah, that was fun. I still really don't have an interest in it. If they invite me out again, I'll probably do it again because it was kind of fun. But if they don't, cool, that was it. And I thought that was a really nice way of kind of summing up how you can end up being sexual, like behavior-wise, but not orientation-wise, because you kind of lack that level of just kind of the crave or the want to do it for the reason of being sexually attracted. So that's how I would sum it up clearly. If you would like to, yeah. this is sort of thing is, is thing we get asked on asexual advice pretty often, and um, one of the best ways to put it is behavior is not orientation. Um, you have people who like the physical act of sex, even if they don't get sexually attracted, and some of them have, um, are more willing to go to do these things and not these things, these things and not these things. This goes back to the um, tendency to try and graph things infinitely. Um, but basically, I mean, there's a wide variety of experience in the ex social community. We're really very welcoming of whatever it is. You'll, you'll probably find other people who've had similar experiences and feelings as you in the community. But if you don't experience sexual attraction, if you don't have any particular desire to go out and have sex as an orientation rather than just nice physical sensations or because you've got your partner se sexual, then sure. <laughs> any other questions? Uh, so on the, the first meeting I went to, there was, uh, there was a guy there who identified as asexual. Um, and he said he, he, he had a female partner and occasionally they would have sex and, and he said that uh, he, he was capable of sex but he had no desire to do it, he'd really rather not do it and the only reason he did it was uh, to make his partner happy. And, um, and when we're talking about sort of uh, arousal, I mean I'm um, homo I think. Um, but I'm not capable of sex. I, mean, I can become aroused, but it doesn't translate into an ability to be sexual with anybody else. And if, I'm, if I hug someone, you know, I'll get very low level um, arousal sometimes, but it's nowhere near enough to, um, to participate in any kind of sexual activity. And you know, I, I wouldn't want to interfere with anybody else's bits and pieces, and I wouldn't want them to interfere with mine. <laughs> but uh, but I, I experience, because uh, when I find someone attractive, I find them aesthetically attractive and emotionally alluring, but just not sexually aroused. Yeah. Um, I think I have, um, uh, I wouldn't say unique because lots of people have this experience, but I, I came into this with having, because I'm transgender and I have this transsexual history, which I do want to stress, this is why I'm bad poster child. It does, it, these are, it's completely unrelated. Nothing to do. I mean, intersectionality and all of that aside, people who people who are asexual can have any gender, and most are most are not transgender. Um, well, maybe that I've seen a census for a thing that applies maybe there are quite a lot. Not not the majority. Um, but having having had I. I have a libido uh, that isn't directed towards sex, and it isn't directed towards um, sexual attraction. And I, because I have this transsexual medical history and I'm transgender, I have experienced high levels of testosterone and low levels of testosterone, and I felt considerably more asexual when I had this constant libido driving sexual feelings that just weren't directed at people. That is a big, you feel a lot more asexual. <laughs> you know, I, you know, now, I'm, I'm, I'm not currently, I'm very, very low testosterone at the moment, and, you know, it, it, asexuality is, is a kind of background thing that isn't a big deal. But when you have this, uh, I've, I've had medication that shoved my testosterone level up to ridiculously high levels, and I'm just constantly going, wow, I'm so asexual, because <laughs> I can't think of anything else other than that, that, that you know, it's, it's, you know, I'm not going to go into any details about the weird abstract things that, that do it, but it's just not, it's just not sexual attraction. And so to me, it was just such a self-evident thing. But, you know, as soon as I'd had experience this, this testosterone level stuff, I was like, okay, yeah, no, there is something here. I'm not questioning it at all. I know that this is asexual. 
So, but there is, I want to, and I want to stress again, there's this massive, we are, a, we are an, an umbrella um, term. We are a huge community that covers anybody who self-identifies with this and finds it useful. We have this gray area, it's in our flag. They, you know, we are huge, and there's people who are completely repulsed by sex, and there's people who are completely neutral to it, there's people who have sex because that's what their partner wants. That we are a huge into all these different experiences, but it's down to whether you find it useful to claim this identity and be part of our community, or just claim it to yourself. There's plenty of people who happily say they're asexual, who've never been involved with anything or any other community, and I'm going to you. God, do you know you're appropriating our entire existence, even that we're mandating everything to you, and how dare you do that, my God. Um, then you get, it's just all sorts of things like, well, you get the sort of questions which, um, like, are you sure something didn't cause this? Lots of like, um, have you had your hormones checked? Um, lots of, do you masturbate? Like, that's any of their business, one way or another. Um, and then you get questions which, um, I'm trying not to be insensitive here, like, were you abused as a child? Which some asexuals were, some asexuals weren't, but plenty of people who were are not asexual. It's not, it's just experience some people get along the lines. Um, or, it's, a lot of it evolve around your health, your history, and anything that may have caused you to be broken somehow. Or your lack of knowledge of biology, or procreation, or something. I, <laughs> Yeah, I tend not to regard questions as stupid because, I mean, people are only, <coughs> people are only going to learn if they ask questions. Well, I think that the most common ones are, this, are the, the, the misconceptions, the difference between asexuality and celibacy, and the, um, and the fact that asexuality is down to, or someone is asexual because of physiological or psychological causes, you know, they've been abused or or so they're taking medications that affect libido, all that kind of thing. So it's mostly it's down to the most, most common ones are, are affected by those two to the misconceptions. But I try not to think about Christian questions as, as stupid, you know, unless they're deliberately mm. using evil purposes or, or taking the mickey. But I try to think, well, <coughs> there's no real stupid questions. It's, it's more, you know, how are people going to learn about something unless they ask questions? So that, that's what I think. That, I'm not sure if they're stupid, but some of the more interesting and um, odd comments I've had, I think my top three are, but aren't you a feminist? And I'm like, yes. <laughs> and usually they're like, but wait, didn't they fight for your right to have sex? I'm like, yes, I'm pretty sure they fought for my right to not do. <laughs> or there's, aren't you a Christian? Yes. Aha! <laughs> okay. But I think the most interesting one I've had came via the Hot Pieces of Age channel, and it was a message to the channel, um, which was like, oh, so you're into animals then? And I was like, <laughs> we've got like 30 weeks of videos up here, and I'm pretty sure not a single one of us has said that right now. I'm really not sure where you're getting that from. But we never figured out where they got that idea from, because they kind of just went away. Um, but yeah, so I think the ones I tend to find most stupid are the ones who like, they take this arbitrary bit of information about yourself and decide that it either disproves always the reason for. And it's most fun when it's things like Christian or feminist, because they're so not linked to anything, at least I guess some things maybe, but hormones is at least somewhat, you can see where they're coming from, but I'm not sure where they were from, so. I don't know if they're necessarily stupid responses, but there's some entertaining ones. Um, I think the classic is always the question of, do you like 
self-pleasure or something. People always want to ask is if they never want to actually say it, and they find the most <laughs> random way. It's just like, you can tell what they're going to ask before it happens. Uh -oh. And then I think probably one of the weirder responses was I was onto my I went to a pride parade and I had a t-shirt that said like asexual on it and I got the ladies talking me at a bus stop and warning me that they might be trying to brainwash me. <laughs> this is an asexuality group, but I should be careful. So that, that was a more entertaining response. Um, then probably the other entertaining response that I've gotten was a rather drunk friend found out that I was asexual and spread out but you're too sexy, you can't be a <laughs> So I'm just like, okay, I'm going to take that as a compliment. <laughs> um, I'm going to go on a slightly separate tab. Um, I actually identify as demisexual, um, and so the responses I get about demisexuality tend to be a diff bit different to the ones I get when I'm just talking about asexuality. Um, I tend to get, isn't that just normal, quite a lot? Um, it's not. Um, as far as I'm aware, um, I've also I've also had um, that like that's a really moral like choice or thing that you're doing. I'm like no, <laughs> um, but th those are probably the demisexuality specific things I've had. Something I've heard people say on this one it's to the Christian thing, but it's not just Christians. Um, you tend to get some people who think um, if Asexual it means you're like really kind of you're being like really good religious wise or kind of pure or holy or something other. And then you get another lot who think you're sort of like giving up God's gift or something or other, and therefore you're being bad. Uh, I, I, I think find that slightly new. I'm 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 an atheist, so I tend to I, I can't speak this from a personal point of view, but I see that around a fair bit too. Um, next question. Any more questions? Yeah. 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 Might as well have it. Thanks. Um, do you see any sort of um, age group or certain type of people you want to like target to educate about asexuality? So is there a particular group like young people? So do we concentrate on educating the young? Or do you think the whole range of people is as important? I would say it was the whole range, basically. Um, I think it's worth talking the whole range because obviously we now have the advance of the internet, so young people who are, I mean, they're not always going to look it up, but there is a way for them to look that up. Whereas people who are old, particularly people who didn't have the internet when they were in the 20s, they do exist. Um, they kind of might need to have seen more because it's a lot harder to access information. Personally, I would say that I tend to target my efforts on a younger crowd that tends to be because I relate easier there and I obviously can't speak for all the people and I do believe like one of my goals eventually is going to be to try and as with the lashing thing doing the alternate to sex education, I do believe it should be part of sex education. So one of the things I'm very passionate about is that target audience. But that doesn't mean that we should be focusing on everyone, it's just that that's where I tend to feel like my strengths are. Um because obviously some people have different strengths to that, so yeah, so generally I do agree that it's something that ideally I'd like to get out to everyone, but it is true that there are certain groups that are easier to work with or that work better for channeling that information out. Um, in particular, I think some of the groups that are mo like easiest or most important to work with in terms of visibility are, first of all, one of the early groups is with LGBT groups, um, especially collegiate groups, which tend to be a little more aware of asexuality, just because when dealing with issues like sexual orientation, they often have a lot of the experience and the background that is necessary. So they have channels that we can already work with. Um, some other important groups would be like sex educators, teachers in school, so that when people are young and they're figuring out, there will be people around them who will have this information. So a lot of student groups and reaching out to young people, especially like sex educators. Also, another good group I think we do need to focus more on is medical professionals, therapists, counselors, doctors, because these are often the people that people go to and they say, like, I have this thing that's different, and so that they can tell them what it is and they won't just make assumptions and do things that will just confuse people more. So I think those are good groups, kind of focused visibility efforts on 
because they are the people that people that are wondering is there any those people that they'll go to. So if we can get information to them, it can get to the people who need it. Uh, yeah, I pretty much agree with what everyone said. Um, getting uh, information about asexuality to everyone is really important, and then obviously there are certain groups who can help us spread that information. I mean, personally, I work a lot with uh, queer groups and student groups, um, and I think uh, queer groups and also feminist groups are really um, good way, good places to go because they're often working towards the same kind of goals that we are. I mean, getting people to say actually, um, you know. You can like not have sex if you don't want to have sex. Is kind of like part of wanting sexual freedom and sexual liberation, which is part of the feminist and queer uh, sort of movement. Um, working against compulsory sexuality is part of compulsory heterosexuality, that kind of thing. Um, so I think uh, queer groups are a really good way to do that because it's sort of the same kind of goal that we're working towards. Uh, I also just want to mention kind of LGBT support groups, like there is, um, someone's going to mention this later I'm sure, but uh, the Trevor Project in the US, which is kind of a, a support line for LGBT and questioning youth, um, kind of acts in a similar way to the, uh, the Samaritans over here, and then they're kind of a hotline if you need some help and you're, you're in danger of hurting yourself or doing worse. Um, they recently decided to include asexuality in the training for the people, um, I mean, I'm not I'm not trying to, I'm sure they get more people who aren't asexual than aren't asexual, but it's good that there's more people out there who can help in case they come across someone who does need help because there, uh, there are people who do really beat themselves up over being different and thinking they're broken and isolated and having, I even heard a case of, um, of this woman, she, she, uh, she was actually documenting it on, I think it might be Tumblr or Life Journal. Um, her parents tried to take her to a psychologist to try and fix her, and she's probably not the only one. And she, and she had wherewithal to kind of know it's not, she's okay with it herself, but not everyone in that situation will be. So, kind of support groups, I think, are another big one. Thank you very much. Um, yeah. Um, I wonder, I wonder if. Somebody else, uh, a full sensing like me, because uh, now I realize that uh, when I was a small one, uh, I didn't test so much food, and uh, I grew up, and I did a little test so much food, and smell. I don't smell things, and I wonder. If it's linked with my asexuality. Mm -hmm. I don't think so. <laughs> um, it's, it's, I'm, it's, I, I've not heard of any kind of um, senses to. I mean, no, I mean, I'm, I'm, sure, I'm sure some people have that. It's just I don't think it's a. Oh yeah, uh, what she's saying, she's asking, um, basically, uh, some of her senses aren't as strong as um, others people seem to be, and she's wondering if it was to do with um, her asexuality, um, and Matt has something to say. Sorry. Um, I, I don't know if this is what's, what's going on with you, but um, I, I'm dyspraxic, I've got, um, it's, it's a type of neurodiversity, a specific learning difference, and undersensitivity or oversensitivity to certain senses is, is one, one of the traits of this. And I certainly think from past census discussions on AFM that there is a higher degree of this in the asexual community. I wouldn't want to speculate on this, and I think we need more research on this. But there may be some correlation. Um, certainly some of the voices on the YouTube channels and the podcasts were along that line. So I think you know, I, I'm oversensitive to taste really ever since it's taste and smell. So and I, I, I have an intersectional view of all these sorts of things. I can't say what's what. But. I am dyslexic. You're dyslexic? I'm dyslexic. It's I bet it if you are old and I look all my life, I will fight against dyslexia. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so yes, I, I mean, I, I have no sense, I don't, like, it would be really interesting to have a census forum, ask yeah. people about this. People who are 
um, who have some form of neurodiversity, whether there's more in the community. I certainly heard more stuff about autistic spectrum traits coming up on the podcast and the YouTube channel, for example. Anyway, I think we're possibly diversity, but no, I, 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 I definitely think that it could be related. I think there's, there's high in brains. It, it, maybe it's just that we tend to question ourselves more because we've already got more something going on, so we're going to things. Anyway. on Tumblr these days, so you see lots and lots of stuff all over the place on Tumblr. So, yeah, you do see people see that. And um, also, you know, people who go to gynecologists um, for like regular checkups and have to explain every single time that no, I'm asexual, no, there's nothing wrong with me, oh, you want to test me, okay, well, not again. Um, you get people who are on medication for one thing or another, and um, people think they cause it, but sometimes you're like that beforehand anyway. And, you get all sorts of things like that. It's, it's one of the habits of trying to make a sexual some sort of medical condition, um, which is um, one of the constant things. There's a HD, what was it called? HSTD. The HSTD um, as well, sort of a thing linked to it. Um, and again, there was, there was a girl who, um, who parents had tried to have a fix, and it wasn't for a medical thing, but I mean, it's not only. You get, doctors do get it. You get lots of asexuals who are very scared of talking to the doctors about being asexual when it comes to anything close to hormones or um, reproductive organs or anything like that because it does happen and you hear a lot of it and they didn't want it to happen to them. Um, but you hear it, yeah. Just to add a note of hope to that, because um, obviously there are a lot of us who don't know about it, but it's not always the worst thing. I have a doctor who has never questioned it. So just to add yeah. that, like, it's not always going to be the worst thing ever, if you tell them. <laughs> um, I mean, I've had, because I've had the same question for a very long time, and I've been both on the birth control pill, on a different birth control, I think I've been on three different ones, because they gave me random side effects. Um, and I've been offered as well, and he's known me the entire time. So my hormones have been like this, um, and there hasn't been a change. So to him, that's now kind of clear that, look, we fiddle with the hormones, nothing happened. He's not, she's not ill in any possible way, because, well, they're quite healthy. And it, from that to him seems to be the case of, oh, well, you know what, well, I, I might not understand this, but, well, she's healthy. I don't know why I shouldn't believe her because there's no evidence to say to the contrary. So, like, you're not always going to get a terrible, terrible thing happening with good doctors. That said, like, a lot of issues that you'll find is if you're kind of, I think sometimes if you're younger and sort of between the ages of maybe 15 and sort of 20, um, I had a lot of doctors who, if you say, oh, have you had sex? Because they need to know for like exams and various things. And you go, no. They go, oh, you don't have to lie to me. I'm not going to tell your parents. <laughs> because the thing is, they do, a lot of the time they're double checking because, especially as a girl between those ages, they need to double check and they need to ask you because 
so many girls won't admit to it, and that can really affect their medication and various things. So sometimes they're not asking to be mean, sometimes that's concerned, but that doesn't mean there aren't cases where it's wrong. But this is obviously why we want to kind of target medical professionals, because they need to kind of be aware that, hey, it's cool, because we're fine, so, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I'm just kind of say seconding that and getting the information out to medical professionals because most of the time when these issues come up with people who are sexual and their doctors, it's not because the doctors are like, oh, let's diagnose you with something. It's because people are telling us like, oh, I don't experience sexual attraction or whatever, and they just have never heard of sexuality. And so the closest thing that they've heard of is like, oh, well, maybe it's like this disorder? Because that, that's the only thing they've ever heard of. So they don't really have the experience or the knowledge that tells them, oh, this is a thing that people can have and still be healthy. Um, so that is one of the reasons that medical outreach is really important. And yeah, I just second that although there are a lot of people who have negative experiences, there also there are also good experiences. Um, I had a fairly good one when I went to a gynecologist. I like talked to her about asexuality, and she kind of admitted that she had never heard of it and knew nothing about it. But she also said like, "Well, I've never heard of it, so I'm, I can't make a judgment on it without knowing more." Um, also, this was like for her, I asked about hormone tests, and she kind of laughed at the idea that you need a hormone test to like fix asexuality or something. So that's kind of a counterpoint to what other people may say. Um, but yeah, there, there is hope out there. Things should get better on that front, hopefully. I think one of the main things that's been a problem in the past sort of year is the house episode that came out. Um, so a lot of the negative things um, are probably going to be in the wake of that. And with kind of added visibility, I would expect kind of the amount of force that added to the media that kind of gave the whole, hey, they're either lying or they have a tumour. Um, if we, there's a lot more evidence going to be now coming out to rebalance that, I mean, the BBC article, we've had a Metro article, so there's a lot more on the other side. So I would, I may be being optimistic, but I would hope that maybe the really, really negative house episode is kind of going to eventually counterbalance out. And luckily doctors probably don't believe house. It's just going to be kind of keeping <laughs> <time. laughs> to register in advance, you should go to Pride websites. They have information about the parade and they'll have information on registration. Uh, if you aren't early enough or if you don't have enough people to say march to parade, there's other things you can do. Um, one thing you do often go to festivals, other groups, you can talk to other people at Pride to see organizations there. Um, so you can talk to like other LGBT groups and like say, hey, have you heard of asexuality? Do you have any resources to support asexuality? Something like that. Other things, just little things like I have on one of my bags, I have some little buttons to say like asexuality, not just for amoebas, or like other buddy things. And I have like one that's on a t-shirt. And we have just like little stuff like that. People see them, they'll say like, ask. And be like, oh, so what is that? And then you can talk about that. So there's even little things, even if you're the only person there. I haven't done um, any of the prize stuff, but I've done kind of the stuff that tends to end up around pride. And a really nice thing you can do, because some people won't come to march, some people really, really don't want to do that sort of thing, is workshops. If, because a lot of time, I know in Oxford pride, they have kind of a week-long thing, so there's much at the end of it, but the week before, there's loads going on. And I did, I didn't do it for the Oxford Royal Pride, I did it for the College Pride, which was at Wadham. Um, and I, did, I, like, I didn't email them, they emailed me to see, but it might be worth getting in touch with the committee who's organizing all of the events and seeing if they would like a workshop on asexuality, because often, I mean, you might get a no, but a lot of the time they're really, really looking for people who are willing to go in and teach people new things and you're guaranteed an audience with a sort of good level of background knowledge because when I did my last workshop at Pride, um, almost everybody there had come either by being LGBT, knowing somebody LGBT, or just being around the college and knowing what was happening. 
So they all, like, I didn't need to explain from scratch, kind of, no, not everyone is straight. They all kind of had that level. So it can be a really good place to get workshops out and things like that. Um, another thing I would say maybe is, whilst Ava is a really, really great hub, I do know some people don't like forums. And it could be an interesting one if, to maybe have additional resources if asked. I mean, having Ava as the main one is really good because it's central. But if people are like, well, I don't really want to join up to a forums, are there any blogs that I can follow? Having kind of good lists on hand of who can write about stuff, just things that they can read instead of having to go and join in, will probably get more people to go and look at stuff. Because I know, like, I would at this point I wouldn't join another forum because I just I don't have time. I wouldn't want to commit, but I probably would go and have a look at the blog somebody sent me to. And I got asked that a lot at workshops for alternate resources. So maybe that could get the point across a bit better. First of all, that um, there's also a lot of people, um, asexuals, who, um, for one reason or another, don't want to be part of Avon. We see that a lot as well, especially on Tumblr, but you see it on Live Journal and Greenwich and other places, um, for one reason or another. Um, also, if on like a lower scale, this comes back to like actually just wearing a flag, people come up and ask you, what is that? Um, I, 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 I take part in um, my hometown's LG, uh, Pride. Uh, part of the, with the LGT branch of the political party that I'm a member of. I'm not saying which one. Just because I, <laughs> yeah. I don't want to talk and spark any political debate here, it's not the point. Um, but I, 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 I take the flag with me, you know, and people do ask a fair bit, what is that? And they find it interested in ask questions. So even if people just want to be more low-key about it, that's a pretty good way of... Risk of your chair. I don't know. Just because I, I have a relevant experience um, just, I have a lot of experience of being involved with other communities who go to local prides. I've, I've done several things at Nottingham Pride, uh, the bi community and the trans community. I've, I've um, sat on their tables and kind of been the representative. And lots of local prides have kind of tents or just outside area where, where any, any organisation can get a table. I don't know whether Avon's got any kind of national fund for people that want to do Pride. Well, well, the place, why I say national is uh, the way the UK Bi community handles things is they, they print out a load of resources like these fantastic flyers here. You get out and you get votes, and then and you'd get placards and banners to take. And then somebody would coordinate sending those on to the next Pride. But okay, lots of Prides do clash, but through that kind of coordination. And, and anybody who's kind of then interested in being on a local pride can go around, all around the country, just individuals can do it. I'm a really huge believer. I have fatigue issues. I'm a really huge believer in setting up things that where anyone can volunteer and make a contribution to a community. And so having like a central set of things like flyers and backups that can be sent on to the next pride is a really good help to me as well. Something to maybe look into at some point. Yeah. I know the banner's been doing that. Yeah, the banner's definitely started, so that's kind of yeah. the old yeah. banner that is. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm just going to answer some of that. Uh, when you're asking, Evan doesn't like have any kind of funding, or so we can't help you much with money issues. However, if you need like flyer designs, or if you want help with getting information, or with like organizational work, that is something that the project team can help with. So you can contact us info at asexuality.org, and that's the kind of thing we'd love to help people with. Um, and also, I didn't say this before, but another thing that you can do is it helps is sometimes if you can kind of piggyback off of another organization. If you know someone, say, like a local campus LGBT organization or something like that, you be like, hey, are you getting a table? Can I like leave some flyers with you? Oh, hey, you have like a marching group. Mind if I like join up and maybe bring a flag with me? Um, so if you know anyone else who is involved with Pride in any way, just be like, hey, mind if I like join up with you? And they can help you get resources and information. So like, if you know anyone who's involved, like milk them for whatever they can get you. Also, just, just a little extra, if you can get flyers, if, if, like, like, I think we've got loads of those flyers up. Even if you don't have a table, I've, got, I've done previous flyers where I've got flyers from something else, and I've just gone to basically every organisation that claims to be a general LGBT and queer organisation and said, oh, oh, you've got a tea, would you like these trans leaflets, or would you like these non-binary leaflets, or would you like these bi leaflets, or whatever, and that 
90, almost nobody had this at the moment. Generally, really interested in put them on their table if they're a general organisation. And that's a really great way of getting visibility because people will go around Pride and see the same leaflets on about half a dozen different tables and you send your network. Yeah, I'd add to that as well, um, as well as going around, like, piggybacking onto other organisations is definitely, like, recommended. Um, I think, if, like, if you can get a stall, um, some sites, I don't know whether Reading Pride does, but some sites have, like, special, like, community, greens community stalls, where you can get stalls, like, much, much cheaper, with, where you might actually be able to post a stall. Um, or if you can't do that, then there's probably, like, a space where you could, like, have something. Um, or just give out leaflets to other organisations. Um, I think as well, probably, there are probably quite a lot of people in this room who would be willing to go to a Pride if you want to organise one. Like, now is probably a, like, today is probably a good networking opportunity <laughs> in itself. <laughs> No, if, if there's enough of you who can do it, it's always best to do your own table and stuff. Piggybacking is good, but it's more like a, if there's only one or two of you and you can't do it by yourself, it looks better. If it's, uh, for like a few reasons, if, if you can do your own table or get your own group together, that's always the best option. And I think Michael's looking at me. <laughs> well, um, I think I'll panel just because I'm very special round of applause.